I just want to make Richard feel at home. Oh, 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 Richard, oh, Richard, wait, wait, wait. We actually all bought a little, a little oh, something wow. just to, yeah, yeah, just to I, make I, you feel good. I did not make get that email in Australia. If it's not trying to eat you, kill you, or poison you, it's probably dead. But he talks about the the compounding interest of relationships. It's the character of 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 your team members, and it's the character of your clients that will actually determine. Um, you know what the outcome is, and, and Richard, can you explain to us what the term "budgie smugglers" means? <laughs> <laughs> um, would you like a demonstration? No. <laughs> Welcome to the Opportunity Accelerators Podcast. This is a show where current and future leaders can be inspired and motivated by those that have. Worked hard to get to the top and have had extraordinary careers. I am joined, as always, by my business partners, friends, uh, international men of mystery, Justin Vianello and Joe Mitchell. What's going on, guys? Thank you. Thank you. How are we? How's it going? I just want to make Richard feel at home. Oh, 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 oh. Richard, Richard, wait, wait, wait. We actually all bought a little, a little oh, something. Wow. Just to, yeah, yeah. Just to I, make I, you feel I, good. I did just not make get that email. Does this make us uh, official jackaroos? We thought it'd be a good idea to have some of our own personal mentors for our first few guests. So I'm going to turn it over to Justin and uh, allow him to uh, introduce our guest for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Vince. Richard, welcome. So I have the pleasure of introducing Richard Brimblecombe. Richard and I worked together at Quantum Power for eight years, and we went through an amazing journey together. From raising angel investment through to series A, B, C, and kicking off an IPO and eventually being acquired, much to our surprise, before we closed that out. It was a great experience which certainly shaped me, and I'm looking forward to hearing how it shaped Richard. Thank Richard you. and I met while we were doing our executive MBAs together at Bond University on the Gold Coast of Australia. Richard grew up on a family farm in Queensland, Australia. In terms of Richard's professional career, it covers agriculture, financial services, and renewable energy. Richard has held executive roles in various companies, including general manager, at both Namoy Cotton and Nutrient, Head of Agribusiness Roles at Commonwealth Bank, and CEO Roles for Quantum Power, Stocko, and Napco. Richard is currently the CEO of AgriCac, a startup niche specialist livestock financing company, and he is also the founder of that company. In addition, Richard has held board roles with various companies, including GRDC, Quantum Power Group, Renew Energy, Stocko Australia, and Mafra Pastoral Company. On a personal ba basis, I've had the great pleasure of getting to know Richard's family, Richard's wife, Al, Richard's daughter, Ashley, and Richard's son, Josh, who turned 21 this weekend, right? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Hard to, hard what, to what's, a, what's a drinking age in Australia? Uh, 18. 18. Oh, yeah. Legal. Yeah, 20, he's, 21, he's 21 21's kind of... <laughs> well, it is my great pleasure to, to, to welcome a mentor of mine. So Richard Brimblecombe, welcome to the Opportunity Accelerator podcast. Hey, yeah. welcome. Hi, Justin. And <laughs> thanks for the introduction, Justin. Yeah. Great to be here. And hi, Joe and Vince. Great to meet hey. you. And uh, really excited to to uh, be chatting with you today. Nice meeting you All as right. well. We're, we're looking forward to getting some really, really good dirt on Justin. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, before we get started, officially, so what I'd like to do is is for the uneducated mm -hmm. amongst us who have not experienced Australia, I wanted to run through a, a couple of Aussie terms, and I was hoping that you could explain, as a born and bred Australian from the land, I was hoping you could explain what some of these Australian terms mean in, in preferably the Queen's English, but if that fails, we'll, we'll do it in American English. So <laughs> let, let me start off on the first one. Richard, can you explain what a fair shake of the sauce bottle means? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we had a prime minister that used to use that term uh, a little bit. He's now our ambassador to America, I think, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he was a great fan. Um, is, is, is the, the, I guess the short version. So um, giving everyone a fair opportunity and, uh, and, uh, and, and a fair go. So yeah, fair okay. shake of the sauce bottle. Okay. <laughs> next, qu next question. Can you explain the term fair dinkum and can you use it in a sentence, please? <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, fair dinkum or, or dinky die. Um, so we uh, we use it a lot here in Oz. Uh, fair, fair dinkum, you know, if you if you're having a fair dinkum go at something, you you know, you're having a 
or, or a red hot go. You know, we um, you're, you're serious about it and you're you're giving it a um, your, your best shot. So uh, fair dinkum is is real, um, and uh, and and you're you know you're giving it everything you've got. So Richard, can you explain to us what the term budgie smugglers means? <laughs> <laughs> Um, would you like a demonstration? No. <laughs> I, I know. I know. Richard likes to actually. I, I know Vince likes to wear it when he visits Europe. He likes to yeah. swim around the beach in yeah. Saint Tropez. So maybe you could uh, explain okay. to us what budget spikes are. I, I, I'm really worried that this is a bad sign about uh, politics in Australia. But you know, <laughs> harking back to the political theme uh, from Fair Shake of the Sauce Bottle to. Uh, uh, yeah, we had a prime minister that was often seen and filmed and pictured by the media in his budgie smugglers, budgie, budgie smugglers. So uh, uh, his name was Tony Abbott, and uh, so he's the equivalent of our, what well, kind of the equivalent of our president, I guess. But uh, uh, budgie smugglers, uh, well, we call them togs. Um, others call them cozies. Um, no, speed, but, speedos. Uh, yeah, speedos. speedos. No. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Another. Well, hang, hang, well, 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 hang on. Hang on, Richard. We've got a CEO who likes to wear those budgie smugglers oh, all yeah. the time, right? We've no, got no, pictures no, no, no. of it. No, L- only on only on the Fourth of July when it's draped in a flag, right? Yeah. So that is yeah. that is as patriotic as you'll ever. That is, that's <laughs> unpatriotic, Vince. Unpatriotic <laughs> or patriotic? It, it, it's an insult to hey, all, hey, all of hey. America. Everything, everything hey. America holds dear. It's an insult. I support, <laughs> I support this country, and this country supports me. All right. Just so, so that you so guys know, a budgie is a small Australian parakeet. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, and my final question before we get on to the serious part of this podcast. And Richard, I want you to think very carefully about this question and how you answer it. Richard, can you explain to us what a whinging palm is? <laughs> uh, yeah. I may have heard this term before. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, choose your words wisely, Richard. Well, look, um, Back in the days when we used to dominate world sport uh, in rugby, <laughs> cricket, cricket, and just about everything else, um, you know, we, we we often referred to to the English teams and their supporters as whinging poms because they were always whinging about you know how we'd unfairly beaten them in sport. But uh, um, yeah. anyway, us us convicts <laughs> out here in Australia, yeah, we sort of refer to the refer to the uh, um, Eng- English people that uh, aren't happy with uh, their lot in life as whinging poms. And look, I've, yeah. got lot, I've got a lot to whinge about. I mean, you know, we've got wide open spaces and blue skies and uh, lots of wind, and, you know. Hey, two sports I don't care about, rugby and cricket. Yeah, and, and, and hence the fact I've been dealing with a whinging pond for four years. Part of the reason why we were all wearing our, our cowboy hats is you were a jackaroo for a period in your career. Right. Mm. Uh, what was it? Two, two years, one year, a yeah, couple of years only. Yeah. Of, yeah. So I'm very keen if you could explain what a jackaroo is and maybe yeah. share some of the experiences that you went through as a jackaroo and how it's, <laughs> it's impacted your career today. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, I was born and raised on a family farm um, and we had grain loosen, uh, or irrigated cropping uh, and, and vegetables loosen, grains and cattle um, and that was in southeastern Queensland and, and also in southwestern Queensland on a much broader scale uh, but uh, a jackaroo is uh, essentially a, um, a stockman uh, or, or an Aussie version I guess of a young cowboy so someone who's you know typically reasonably fresh out of school um, or, or reasonably new uh, and uh, you know is working on a cattle property or a livestock property cattle or sheep uh, and is you know responsible for for, for tasks associated with um, you know managing livestock on a typically a very very large property. So we call those jackaroos or or jillaroos in the case of, of of the ladies. So I spent a couple of years jackarooing in in um, in southwestern and sort of uh, western central Queensland. Um, it was a wonderful time of my life, and I fell in love with uh, I guess what you guys would call you know the outback, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know spent many nights. Uh, camping under the stars in a swag, what we call a swag, which is a, basically a bed you roll out in the dirt and sleep on the ground um, and, uh, you know, managing livestock. So it's a, it's a great time where you can uh, kind of find yourself and, and you get a lot of time to yourself and you get to enjoy beautiful open skies and, uh, and actually sync up with, um, with, with the livestock. So one of the great things about being involved in the livestock industries is you actually, um, you know, 
get a real sense of um, how to, how stock are feeling and how they respond to human interaction and how to handle them in a low stress low stress manner. Um, so, which is something that's really important. But yeah, jackarooing was a great time. You encounter any uh, predators or have any, <laughs> any almost near deadly encounters with snakes or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of a lot of dangerous things in Australia. Yeah, look. Um, in Australia, if it's not trying to eat you, kill you, or poison you, it's probably dead. Um, <laughs> it's uh, look, uh, never look, had plenty of close encounters with snakes. A very good mate of mine actually uh, jumped in his swag one night and uh, had about a six foot brown snake curled up inside the swag, um, and so got got the fright of his life. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, you know, reacted very quickly and jumped out and wasn't bitten. But uh, yeah, both he and the snake, I think, got a rude shock. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we've got lots of lots of wildlife out there that uh, that can harm you. But but typically, if you leave it alone, um, it's just as afraid of just as afraid of us as we are of them. So give them a wide berth, treat them with a bit of respect, and things generally work out. But <laughs> yeah, many, many people don't know that there are actually a lot of feral camels that roam around Australia. Right? Well, people don't know that. Never knew that. Maybe. Australia has the greatest population, I believe, of camels in the world, uh, and they're running feral in outback Australia. So they're actually a pest, um, and uh, there's a lot of operations now that harvest them, and they're you know they're, they're basically harvested and sent off um, for their meat. Huh. Mm. There we go. So, what does so camel meat taste like? Yeah, I was going to say, is it better than an Impossible Burger? Yeah, no. Look, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like it's like everything that's not beef. It tastes like chicken. <laughs> it's a big chicken <laughs> so so just following on that theme before i hand over to uh, vincent joe to ask questions so obviously i had the pleasure of meeting your late father and uh yeah he was a great guy uh actually had the pleasure of playing tennis against him a couple of times yeah. and being being four games up he came back in his 70s and beat me i was devastated yes. um, but he, he was a great guy he was also a very successful farmer and you know you had a pathway to take over the and, and a very well regarded farmer, and so you had a pathway of of taking over the family farm, which had been in in the family for some generations, and continuing on that path. But you chose to go another route. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about you know what steered you in that direction? And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's um it, probably a culmination of things, JV. But you know, Dad. Dad, my dad was an incredibly hard worker and he absolutely, um, he operated with complete disregard for his physical well-being and probably sometimes mental well-being. We, we never thought about it in those days, but uh, mm. he, he absolutely destroyed his body throughout his working life and but did it happily and, and, you know, loved doing what he was doing, but, uh, you know, paid a price in the long run. But uh, so, you know, he instilled in us, I guess, uh, an ethic of hard work very early in life. And, and uh, you know, it's something that's kind of stayed with me. I, I still rise almost every morning, uh, if not before 5 a.m., then right on 5 a.m. And, uh, um, you know, that just comes from, from my early days at home. And as a school child, um, I, I remember being out bailing hay with Dad um, during the night. Often you'd have to wait until the moisture content was right and the temperature was right and the dew fall and those sorts of things. So often we'd be bailing hay at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning and I'd um, be coming home after bailing with Dad and, uh, you know, racing racing to get my school clothes on to catch the school bus to go to school and go to school smelling of, of loose and hay. Um, so, yeah, we, he worked us hard and we loved it and, and you know, um, built a – certainly, you know, helped us understand the importance of a strong family unit as well uh, and, you know, I guess some very – Good values in life around you know honesty integrity hard work uh, and a fair go um one of the you know dad always wanted the best for everybody else and um so he spent his whole time trying to talk myself and my brother and, and i have a younger sister as well uh, out of coming home to the farm and all i ever wanted to do was come home to the farm um as, as a young man but uh, he spent a lot of time talk, talking us out of it because he wanted something better for us and he he felt that you know it was a hard life and and you know financially the rewards weren't great um but so in the end and, and that probably you know influenced my thinking a little bit but um one of the other quirks i guess about me is that as i went through school um and from the moment i was born numbers just spoke a language to me I, I, and it was a language I, I, well, I think I understand and uh, I've, I've 
you know, numbers came easily, always very good at maths and economics and accounting and those sorts of things as a, at school. So came as no surprise that when I left school um, uh, and, and you know, I had an opportunity, well, the, a local bank was, was looking for someone as a school leader they could bring into a bit of a trainee program, wanted someone with good re results in accounting and economics, those sorts of things. So... I ended up, you know, going into that industry um, and 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 hated working, you know, in in a building behind closed doors and um, those sorts of things. So uh, eventually went jackarooing for a couple of years, uh, but but I never really I never really was able to shake my love of numbers and and ultimately, you know, had ten years with with. Uh, a bank here in Australia, a regional bank called Suncorp, or just shy of ten years, and then you know moved into you know moved into quite senior roles in that bank, and then you know into senior roles in agri business. So my whole life, even when I was in banking, I was in agri business related banking. So, and, and even when we got into renewable energy, where JV and I started working together, it was a business that was very much uh, focused on supporting agricultural related industries. So throughout my entire life. I've always had this connection with Agri, and uh, I, I, whilst I didn't go home to the family farm um, because it was, it, I, I was always very, very, um, very keen on on livestock farming operations, and our family farming business had a very strong bias towards cropping and irrigated cropping, and and uh, for whatever reason, you know, always had an affinity with with animals. Uh, you know, wanted to go a different direction, and as it as it turns out, I, throughout my um, business career and executive career, I have owned and developed and uh, operated um, a number of quite large-scale livestock enterprises. And to, to, today, I still own a, a livestock enterprise on the Western Downs in southern Queensland. It's about uh, 1,300 hectares. So I, know, I, th I think in your speak, 3,200 acres uh, on the Western Downs where I run Angus uh, and uh, Wagyu Cross um, cattle. So uh, never, never lost the connection to the farm and have always maintained it. And Retirement for me looks like more farming. Um, <laughs> yeah, back so, back, back um, to the family business. Yeah, so I've never been able to shake it, and and it, you know they, you can take a boy out of the farm, but you can't take a farm out of the boy, and yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's certainly been been true for me. Yeah, so I'm you know curious with uh, obviously it sounds like you had a close relationship with your dad and heard that you you know learned your your work ethic from him. What other lessons can you recall that you, you took from kind of working side by side with your dad on the, on the farm? Yeah, look, um, <laughs> there's probably, there's probably too many to name, but I, I, I think, you know, that my, my dad was known as an incredibly hard worker and that, that, that hard work ethic was one, um, you know, I, I think the other, the other really big one is the importance of the family unit uh, and, and, and the importance of treating other people fairly. Um, so, Dad really instilled very strong family values. You know, we operated the farm as a family unit, um, and you know, we 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 all pitched in and did what had to be done. And uh, I think you know the extension of that is is um, you know into the workplace. You know, building a you know a family feel uh, in the workplace. Is so, Richard, you and I did our MBA together, and but you didn't go to university before that, right? You decided to pursue a career. And you've often shared with me um, some of the challenges you had with not going to university, right? Some of the personal challenges. Yeah. How do you feel about employers starting to drop degree requirements for <laughs> the people that they start to hire? And, yeah. and how do you believe that's going to help empower employees and grow their workforce? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, JV. And I think, you know, I, I was very, very keen for my children to go to university um, and, and uh, you know, which is interesting, but you you know, it's, it's I guess it's like Dad did for me. You know, we want the best for our children, and uh, um, and my daughter is just finishing a nursing degree, <clears throat> and uh, but my son's do actually doing a trade, so he's he's an apprentice electrician. But I, I look, you know, I got busy in my career, and um, I kept being promoted into roles that I wasn't qualified for as a young man, and and um, and no one, you know, once you're actually in the workforce and you're rolling, no one actually asks about your academic. Um, background uh, often it's a pre prerequisite to actually getting in the front door, but once you're in the door, no one asks about it ever again. Was my experience, and so, uh, and you know, I, 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 certainly the training that I was the beneficiary of from organisations I worked with in my throughout my career, um, you know, I, I acquired the skills that many people, you know, 
uh, went to university to get, but I actually acquired them in a, in a, in a context of a real workplace. And so, you know, certainly from from my perspective, um, you know, we look for people that that have a level of of of, of intelligence, but also you know that emotional that that EQ as well as the IQ. So, um, you know, our view is that. Um, you know, attitude is is more important than anything else. So if you've got someone with a good positive outlook, a good positive out, uh, attitude that wants to be part of a team and make a contribution, well, I'll, I'll take that person over. You know, a university qualified um, employee who doesn't, you know, who doesn't have that same outlook every day of the week. So um, because you know, someone with the right approach to life or, or a positive approach to life is certainly um, you know more than capable of picking up the skills necessary to be successful in in their role. So. Um, I, I think it's a great thing to answer your question. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's important for young people to go to university and get a qualification, you know, if they're pursuing, you know, a, a particular dream. But, but, but I'd also say to people, young people that that haven't gone to university for whatever reason, or and and may not have had the opportunity, or, you know, your 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 attitude will determine your altitude. Um, so, you know, you can go as far as you like without without a university degree. Getting the start will be the challenge, but once you're up and running. Um, you know, you, you, the only limitation is 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 our mindset, and so I think you, it's wonderful that employers, are, you know, are, are, are focusing less on the degree on, on that degree qualification these days. Can you think of an example where you kind of took a chance on somebody that that had <laughs> you think you thought had the emotional intelligence and and the uh, you know the right attitude? They didn't have the technical skills, and then they ended up coming on and and really you know doing something incredible. Yeah, I, I can. I mean, we, we've we've got a team member in AgriCap um, who is actually doing a university degree at the moment um, by correspondence. Um, she's, a, uh, you know, this whole working from home thing is uh, all flexible working arrangements has really changed the dynamic. And you know, this particular team member, um, I'll probably embarrass her if she listens to this podcast, but she 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 lives um, seven hours inland on a very large cattle station with her partner and his family. Um, and uh, she, she, this is actually the third time she's worked in businesses that I've worked in. Um, so we've worked together before and she was a young, enthusiastic and still is a young, enthusiastic operator um, with, with a wonderful outlook on life. And, and um, you know, she heard one of one of my team members when I was at the CEO at Stockco speak at a young beef producers forum and sort of tracked us down and wanted to catch up for a coffee. Um, we had a coffee with her and um, She's such a you know, bright, positive, intelligent um, human being that we were very keen to put her on, and 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 actually did put her on. She hadn't done any university work, you know, at that point in time, uh, but had a, a passion for ag, a love of life, and was was innately intelligent. So, um, you know, she did really, really well across a number of roles there. Uh, when I moved to the North Australian Pastoral Company, um, she she came across there and and worked um, in 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 the finance team. Uh, there and and when we founded AgriCap, she was actually our first employee, uh, ah, and wow. she continues to shoot the lights out. She's now um, you know heavily involved in our financial modelling, and well, she's actually heavily involved in all aspects of our business, in, including um, essentially administering our Salesforce um, instance that we run our business on. So um, just a, a, and look, she's in her early twenties. She was always just too busy to go to uni, um, but yeah. uh, but. But has focused, you know, uh, pretty hard on on her own personal development as long as I've known her. Um, so just just an outstanding young person, and and you know, will be able to do anything she wants to do. And and she was uh, the first pe first person that we granted equity to in the business outside of myself and my co founder. No, that's amazing. awesome. And material so equity. That's yeah. that's terrific. Um, you talked a little earlier about you know some of the values your father instilled in terms of treating people like family, building relationships, strong relationships. It certainly seems like that's what you've got here. Um, how do you value that and how have you built other relationships? And obviously I know you've got a great relationship with Justin, but how mm. important is that to building your businesses? And I know you've built a lot of really successful businesses over time. Yeah, look, it's, it's a great question, Joe. And I think, you know, um, the business we're building has got some really smart, um, you know, IT in 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 the background. We, you know, we've built our platform um, on a Salesforce instance, uh, but you know, it's it's the system we've built is quite unique, uh, and we've done a lot of things in Salesforce that Salesforce told us we probably either couldn't do or shouldn't do. But um, and it's working <laughs> wonderfully for us. But um, 
you know, I, I, I think whilst tech is important, um, you know, we are servicing uh, primary producers. So our, our, you know, our, our customers, if you like, are, are livestock, you know, mum and dad, family farming, livestock producers right across mm-hmm. Australia. And the thing we know that they crave and they value is, is, is a relationship with someone who, is, who understands their business understands the challenges they face and is genuinely interested in assisting them to achieve their, you know, their aspirations and their, and their ambitions. And so um, for us, it's all about the relationship. And whilst we've got this really, you know, clever tech platform, um, we won't do business with anyone unless either one of us or a, 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 um, an accredited representative has actually been on farm. Uh, yeah. Because for us, it's all about the relationship. You know, we kind of talk about, you know, we run the ruler over, uh, you know, run the rule over the client. Well, really, what the, the thing that we focus on the most is the character of the people that we do business with. Uh, sure. Because when everything else turns to shit and, you know, things go bad um, uh, or don't go as planned, it's the character of, of, of your team members and it's the character of your clients that will actually determine, uh, you know, what the outcome is. And, and so, you know, we, we adopt in ag, it's cyclical, it's seasonal, you get droughts, you get floods, you get market movements. And so sure. um, you often have very, very good people that are impacted quite negatively. And for us, the way you get through those challenging times and the way you support your team members and your clients through challenging times is by developing, you know, a, a, a robust relationship where that is, you know, built on the premise that you deeply care about your your customers and your, and your team members. And if that's yeah. your starting point, if that's your starting point, I think you can build a very robust business. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think people buy from people and people who yeah. are authentic and people they believe they can trust so that yeah. when times are tough, you have the opportunity to solve that problem together. And I know yeah. that's super important in all the relationships that we've been in because yeah. nothing ever goes smoothly. Yeah, it's one of our core values. Exactly. Yeah, and look, yeah. we've got a saying here. It's a little, you know, pardon the the, the sexist aspect of it, um, but I'm I'm sure it could be changed. But we, you know, people follow the man, not the mob. Yeah, and it, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's this guy, Novel Ravikant. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's a Silicon Valley uh, investor. He's kind of a mo- modern day philosopher, but he talks about the the compounding interest of relationships. Yeah. And, you know, and it, it, certainly if you've ever been in sales, but I think it applies to just about any role, you know, you build that relationship and you, you prove you can deliver and you, you've got that kind of reputation. The next sale is that much easier. The one after that's that much easier. You know, there's just, there's just no shortcuts, right? I mean, you know, where we come from when we're selling is that we try to understand what the client's need is and what their mm. aspirations and ambitions are. And, and then, construct something that actually propels them towards those goals and and so that's that makes selling very very easy yep. yeah we had a, we recorded a podcast yesterday with a gentleman that's a ceo of a SaaS company and uh i thought it was interesting his definition of a customer is anybody that's not him and that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh and you know that's what he teaches all his people so anybody you're dealing with to your point yeah. right you're probably either you know, collaborating with them or partnering with them, some level, you have to contribute something. Yeah. And, you know, I think having that attitude is really helpful, especially, you know, we're we're talking about people that are starting their careers. I think that's also, you know, really good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, so Richard, I want to come back to a point that you actually raised, you sort of led into it on the emotional intelligence piece. So, you know, I was initially sort of introduced to this concept of emotional intelligence when we were actually doing our MBA together. And it yeah. sort of resonated with me because um, it was a, a, a sort of academic term that I actually saw in action, you know, through my interaction with you. And, <clears throat> you know, when, when we sort of started working together and started to get to know each other, you probably know back then, um, I used to approach uh, every obstacle that I faced by sort of putting my head down and charging towards it. And yeah, seeing pull, it, it pull it a gate immediately comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to scare everyone away. But, um, you know, I always thought your approach was, was very different. You know, you were methodical, you were deliberate, you thought about it. You try to find, um, you try to find a way to, to get an outcome that worked well for everybody. And mm. you were very thoughtful and deliberate with the way you approached that. So, you know, I learned a lot from working with you in terms of that emotional intelligence. And I'm, I'd be interested to know 
Where do you think they came from? I suspect it was not from Justin. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, look, you know, it was a bit of drift away from that when I hang around Jay Lee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yes. no, look, we, um, yeah, for all of, for all of Dad's good points, I think you know one of one of his challenges was that he was actually somewhat socially awkward, um, and, and you know part of that was I think you know from the isolation of of you know living on a on a on a farm you know not not in town as part of a you know a, a close community, but you know he um, ha having said that you know whilst he was a you know a, a loving father he he was he was a little socially awkward in, you know, in groups of people that he didn't know well and, and those sorts of things. But, you know, for those that were in his inner circle, he was, he was, you know, he was terrific. Um, so I get, I guess, you know, I, I kind of had some um, challenges to overcome in, 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 in that sense. And I'm not really sure where I got it from. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not by any stretch suggesting that it's a strength of mine now. It's something that, you know, I feel, you know, we all need to continuously work on, but I just come back to that point. If you, if you are coming from a place where you deeply care about the person that's sitting across the table from you, whether they're a, a, a client or a team member, or they're just someone you know that you're you're interacting with. You know, if you're genuine in that care for that individual and their perspective and where they're coming from, if that's your starting point, then things get really easy after that. And so, um, you know, even even you know when you're in conflict with somebody and they've got a very different point of view, um, if you're genuine in trying to understand their point of view, even though you may never agree with it, um, then um, you know at, at least. You know, from an insight perspective, you, you can develop an understanding of what's driving their behaviour and 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 their approach. And you know, Justin, we may talk about this a little a little later. But you know, we we kind of went to war at Quantum Power. We had yep. a group of minor shareholders who banded together and tried to force um, their will on the business. And mm. and you know, as as directors and executives of the company, we had a fiduciary responsibility to all shareholders, not just some, in the end, whilst I never agreed with them, developing that understanding positioned us to actually fend it off mm. um, and be very, very clear about, um, you know, where the flaws were in their thinking, um, which probably led to us in successfully, um, you know, fending off that challenge. And sometimes it gets really, really hard. Um, <clears throat> but, but at the same time, you know, I think it, it remains important just to be really clear about where you're coming from and what your starting point is in any conversation. Yeah, I, I remember that. That was probably the toughest meeting that I've ever had to attend, be part of, make comments. I think we went to war together as a team, and I'll, I'll say as a team because there were other people involved. And yeah, it yeah. did end up getting there in the end, but we certainly have the scars to prove it. So, you know, on that point, Richard, um, that's not the, the only time you face challenges in your career. And mm. so are, are the other times that sort of come to mind where you faced major challenges, you've been able to navigate through it and what are some of the things you've learned from it? Yeah, look, I think um, throughout my corporate career, there have been a number of times where I've been asked to make big changes quickly to businesses. Um, and, you know, I reflect on those times and if I had my time again, I would, you know, there are certain circumstances where I would, I would do things differently and approach them differently um and and you know it's it, it comes back to the people and and um you know always treating people with dignity and respect and, and I'm, I'm i'm not saying you know that i'm guilty of not having done that but i think it's it's always having that deep concern for others i think and when i was a young man um you know i'm sort of in my 50s now and but, you know, in, early in my career, when I was in, I was in you know, my late 20s in general management roles with large teams reporting to me, um, you know, and, and we were moving quickly, you know, when I, when I reflect on it, you know, I've got some regrets. So, you know, I probably wasn't as um, um, diplomatic, you know, <laughs> as, I, as I could have been. We, we, you know, we moved quickly. We're in a hurry. Um, you know, we didn't spend the time. I, I personally didn't spend the time you know, trying to understand people's positions as much as I could. And that's, that's sort of, you know, something that's, um, I wouldn't say it's haunted me, but it's something that I I carry and, and it is a regret. So I, you know, now that I'm a little more mature and a little older, 
you know, I, I think when it when it comes to making big changes that impact individuals, and you know, we never know what's going on in someone's life, and um, and, and and I think you've you know, it's very important to approach engagement with others, particularly when you're the bearer of bad news. You know, from that perspective, that you know, we we actually don't know what you know what is going on, and sometimes that is the cause of bad behaviour. And when it is, you've got to focus on the behaviour, not the person. That you know, fundamentally, my view is that um, you know, pretty well, just about everybody is a good person, but sometimes they behave badly, and that's that's when you know the focus should be on the you know behaviour, not the. Uh, not the, not necessarily the individual. So, Justin, is Richard the person who told you to look at the pattern of behaviour over, you know, the actual? Yeah, he said, he said to me, uh, Richard, the one who taught me, don't look at one incident, look at a pattern yeah. of behaviour. Right. Yeah. So, anyone, but anybody could have a bad day. Anybody can do something stupid or silly or irresponsible. But what you got to look is a, a pattern of behaviour. And coming back to the point that Richard raised previously. You know, that EGM was a very, very serious thing. When you're a public company and you call an EGM, that's no joke. Mm -hmm. and Justin, why don't you explain what an EGM is? Yeah, Richard can probably explain it better than me. Rich, it's, a, it's an extraordinary general meeting. So it's when a, a um, shareholders, I guess, they, they have to represent more than what, Richard, 5%? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an out of cycle general meeting um, of, of all the shareholders where specific motions <laughs> Are put to those shareholders that have been raised by by either directors or shareholders, and and in that particular extraordinary general meeting, um, two of the directors, uh, you know, put eight motions to the shareholders, and the the, the crux of those eight motions were that, um, you know, Justin and myself and uh, an, another director be removed from the board, uh, and and um, you know. So, some other sort of you know key key business changes. So their focus was you know they were attacking us as individuals uh, rather than trying to solve for uh, the best outcome for all of the stakeholders of the business, and which is why we fought it. I mean, if it was a if it was a, a personal spat, then you know you sort of say, well, we'll 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 keep this out of the shareholders, and you know we might resolve it amongst ourselves, but. It was much, much more than that, uh, and certainly that you know it negatively impacted the business, and it needed to be resolved quickly. And so, you know, I guess that extraordinary general meeting was in some ways a positive in that it brought everything to a head pretty quickly, and mm. you know, some changes were made. And hey, I just wanted to rewind. You you had mentioned you know early on in your career, and you kind of got into your first leadership roles. Mm. What were some other things that that you did to try to become a better leader? And did you have somebody that was a mentor to you professionally that <laughs> yeah. besides Justin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's Vince, I've, I've probably had, you know, three or four really important mentors throughout my, my life. And, you know, starting with, with my dad, um, I, I, I maintain a very close circle of, of, of long standing friendships and, Whilst they are, you know, very, very good friends, um, I, I also regard them as 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 mentors, or they, you know, they have a mentoring role as as a friend. Um, but you know, th there was a very prominent agribusiness lawyer here in in in, in Queensland um, who I met as a young man in my in the, my in my banking days, and he was representing a number of clients um, who were buying properties that we were funding and those, so, you know, I ended up having quite a bit of interaction, became good friends. And that was, you know, a 30 year, a 30 year relationship. Mm, wow. uh, and, you know, he really, be, he was a, a, a real country gentleman, uh, and, and, and a lawyer, but, but, you know, um, sharp as sharp as a whip and, and, uh, you know, he gave me some wonderful advice, and you know, another important mentor um, is, is is a guy now well into his seventies, uh, who uh, I still catch up with every couple of months for a coffee. Who you know uh, came from you know, somewhat of a disadvantaged family, and 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 ultimately um, uh, you know be, became a, a, a surgeon, uh, and um, so in the medical profession, and but. But from rural areas, and and um, you know, I think in his forties started acquiring farming assets, and uh, and put together a, an enormous portfolio of very very high quality farming assets um, in in his lifetime, and um, that's sort of now you know transitioning to to um, others. You know, he's been a, 
a, a really important mentor for me on the professional side and a really important mentor who has continued to and, and who I still continue to, to see often and value is Justin's dad, Colin. So, um, you know, when Justin and I were at Quantum Power, Justin's dad was was an investor and a shareholder, uh, was on the board at various times, actually was really you know, the guy that convinced me to leave a very stable, high paying bank job and go and work for this startup as, 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 <laughs> as, as, as MD. And uh, I think my wife thought I was crazy at the time. I'm not sure she's ever forgiven Colin for that, but um, <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it was actually a wonderful experience. You know, I remember one particular circumstance where we had a, we actually had a, a essentially a strategic partnership or a joint venture with a, with a US company. And the principal of that company um, was a very, very difficult individual, technically brilliant, uh, but, 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 you know, had a history of not being able to maintain business relationships. And, um, uh, you know, we had a, a pretty difficult time with, with that guy. I mean, we, we achieved some great outcomes together with him, but, you know, the relationship was, was challenged at various times. And I remember, you know, I, I actually went to the US and um, visited a, I guess a competitor of his looking at, at, at technology alternatives because that relationship was just so difficult. And um, he became aware that, uh, that I had, you know, had been in the US and in a part of the US where, you know, one of his major competitors was. And um, he, he, he called and uh, challenged me on that. And, and uh, initially I just said, oh, you know, yes, I was in the US, um, you know, I, I was over there on a break now. Um, I rang, I rang Colin, Justin's dad immediately and said, look, Colin, just making you aware that, uh, Colin was on the board at that time. You know, I had this call from Mark and he said, oh, you know, what did you, what did you say to him? And, um, he said, Richard, you, you must call him back and you must tell him the absolute truth. Um, and, and so that was, a, that was really significant for me because it kind of felt like a, you know, I was just a bit of a white lie, but, um, you know, the, the, the standard that you know that Colin you know required of of me personally and 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 requires of everyone around him and I'm sure requires of Justin is you know that absolute impregnable honesty uh, and you know that 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 absolute commitment to integrity ethics um, you know it reminds me of uh, I'm not going to certainly mention any names but several years ago we had an employee that we had to part ways with. He left uh, not under the, the greatest uh, of circumstances, did some very unscrupulous and potentially illegal things. And Justin, I remember talking to you and, and you know, I don't know if you remember this story exactly, but I do. I do. You, uh, you referenced your dad and that kind of helped you decide how to deal with it. Do you want to share that? Yeah, I think I've been with the company for three weeks. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a Friday. I remember this distinctly. It was a Friday night. It was winter. Um, I was in the driveway of my home, I just pulled in and I was on the phone with uh, Vincent Haney and uh, we were talking about how we were gonna deal with the situation and going back and forward and I, and I paused and I said, look guys, if I was asking my dad what to do, it would be very simple. He'd say, what's the right thing to do? And I'd be able to answer that immediately. And the right thing to do is to deal with this individual, not accept what was done. And whatever happens as a result of that, we'll figure it out afterwards. But that is the right thing to do. We're not going to compromise on this. One of the things, Richard, I'm interested in is I know having spent two years almost living with Justin in Reston when we share the corporate apartment, <laughs> I, I, I feel like I've, I've been part of, you know, quantum for many years. Um, it's, uh, I know more about Pyre stations than I care to know about. But what, one thing that resonated with me uh, is that I know Justin views you as a real mentor. Um, so I'm really curious cause I'm still trying to figure this out. What is it you saw in Justin <laughs> and what strengths does he have? Yeah. Oh, you're uh, going to put him on the spot now. I was going to yeah, say, I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't Richard's mentor. I was his tormentor, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you might have to leave the room here, JV. But, uh, yeah, look, um, there's no doubt that, that, uh, you know, a lot of the, 
the wonderful values and attributes of Justin's dad have been passed on to Justin. And so it, it makes him, you know, a very easy person to have as a friend and, and, and also someone that, you know, it's very easy to trust and, and, and trust implicitly. So very, very easy to develop close relationships with people that, that have, uh, a, a, you know, fundamentally a good set of personal values. Um, and, and so, you know, Justin is someone that is sincere, genuine, honest, you know, in, in, intelligent, um, I don't think I'll ever forgive Liz for taking him to the US. Um, <laughs> you know, I kind of figured we were going to go and do a lot of things here in Oz, but um, I might have yeah. to come over to you guys for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Well, I, don't, well, I don't think I'll forgive her either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad this is being recorded. It's the nicest thing which has ever said about it. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask about... Um, Obviously, you and Justin met at the uh, the MBA program. I had listened yeah. to a, another podcast that you had done. You talked about how that really sort of lit your entrepreneurial passion, being part of that program. Do you remember a particular moment where, you know, this is kind of like, wow, I'm, I'm going to do this? Like, what, what was it that inspired you? You know, up up until I'd done the MBA, you know, my I'd worked, you know, in in a corporate capacity. I'd worked in you know, large, you know, typically listed companies for for my entire life uh, up up to that point. Other other than you know my my early years uh, jackarooing um, and 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 on the farm, but um, other than that, always you know in a large corporate environment. Um, and you know, doing the MBA. Um, one of the unique things about Bond University is that, you know, it's a private university and there's this real entrepreneurial flair that kind of oozes organisationally through the place. And, and so, um, you know, the, the, the faculty members that, were, that we engaged with in that program really pushed us and encouraged us to, to um, you know, sort of dig deep and, 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 and find that entrepreneurial flair and bring it to the surface. And, and, and a lot of those things, you, you know, when you're working your whole life in big companies, you know, they're driven down. So, you know, this um, aversion of risk, you know, risk aversion, um, you know, governance, those sorts of things, which are really, really important for, you know, businesses to be successful. Um, but, but I guess, you know, what, Bond was about saying, well, look, you know, if you, if you, you know, could develop some skills that minimise the risk of failure, uh, and you know, what, one of the things that Bond did was it actually helped, help realise that failing's okay too. <laughs> you know, it's uh, sometimes you've got to fail to learn, right? By the time I'd finished that MBA program, I, I had done it essentially on a full time load, so what had taken a career break to do it, um, I had a role waiting for me with the Commonwealth Bank, which is you know one of, well, the biggest banks here in Oz, and um you know wonderful place to work I, i've got to say the you know the entrepreneurial fire had been lit i'd lost the desire to be you know a a cog in a in a machine and and really wanted to be you know part of a smaller business that was much more dynamic that could move more quickly and um and that was you know kind of breaking new ground and 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 and, and i just you know i've never really been able to um to to break away from that, you know, once that fire was lit, you know, it kind of turned into a bit of a raging bushfire and, and, and still burns today. I just have no desire whatsoever to go back into a, you know, a, you know, I just love the fluidity and the challenges and the highs and the lows and the, you know, the, you, you know, the, the, I guess the constant um, intellectual challenge associated with, you know, starting you know, a startup or, 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 you know, something that's reasonably new. i so when you finished the program, did did you take the job with that large bank that you had mentioned? Yeah, look, I I, I did take the job. It was and you know it was one of those ones where we made a lot of changes really quickly. There was a, they were looking for a change agent, so I took that. Um, I, I I actually was on the board as a non executive director of Quantum Power at the time, and and stayed on the board. But you know uh, ultimately, um, you know I guess with a lot of cajoling from 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 Colin. Um, who was actually uh, also on the board at that time um, left the bank to to take on that role at, at at Quantum. So Quantum was this business that had raised various amounts of capital from a lot of you know, small amounts of capital from a lot of shareholders that had really kind of hadn't 
you know, hadn't been able to get any kind of momentum or, or um, you know, velocity about its business. And so, um, you know, there was a level of frustration there. And, um, and, and, and so, yeah, I left the bank to, to, to take the reins at Quantum and, you know, we got on with it. Um, and after Quantum, is that when you transitioned to uh, what you're doing now? Yeah, so um, that's that's correct. So we we basically sold the quantum power business into that ASX listed entity, uh, and and as we did that, um, I, I had actually been doing some consulting work for um, a, a, a guy in New Zealand um, who had been running a livestock finance company over there, who, who and who had been trying for some years to get a, a livestock finance business up and running in Australia, and ultimately he asked me to come and you know set the Australian business up for him and and take on the CEO role there, which we did. And look, he he put um, you know a very small amount of capital into that business. Uh, we did a number of different corporate deals uh, along the journey, raised a lot of a lot of debt and a lot of uh, well, we didn't raise. To be quite honest, we actually didn't raise very much equity at all. We 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 sold thirty percent of that business to a large ASX listed company. And secured, uh, they had a wonderful distribution platform, and so we secured, you know, um, a, an awesome distribution platform, and, and the business just went boom. It was a, it was a great, a great journey and a great ride. Amazing. Yeah. So, Richard, before we get to the lightning round, I'm gonna. Wow. Do you recognise that? Do you I recognise those? those? I reckon, I cannot yeah. believe you've still got those. And that that I right there, them. that right there is. is can you, is, can you tell uh, the audience what it is? Yeah, so that's a pair of RM Williams, that, um, and and that that right there is. I mean, how old those those boots have got to be? What eleven, twelve years old? Yeah, yeah. Perhaps, yeah do, you, older. do you remember how? Do you remember how I won these boots? I I, I can't. I know. I know that you won them. But yeah, the fact that you've still got them and you've you still <laughs> wear them is is testament best. to the Australian craftsmanship that goes into go. a pair of RM it's Williams. Me, it's, it's, so I won best dress classic male, and I'll qualify classic was more than thirty five years old, so I just missed it. Best best dress classic male at the Gundawindi race day. That's right. That's yeah. right. And if you remember, there, there was a blue blue napkin that was the pocket square that won the day that afternoon. That's true. What, yes. Where where was this? What event was this? This this was a, a horse racing. All right, boys. Uh, I think Is it we time are for the lightning rolling round? into the lightning round. Here we go, right. Rich. Okay, you ready? Yeah. So here we go. Here we go. First question, and there's 20. So first question. 20. Uh, wallab- yep, here we go. Ready? Wallabies or kangaroos? Wallabies. Okay. Marlin or selfish? Oh, marlin. Okay. Koala or wombat? Koala. Texting or talking? Talking. Wildest cab ride? Wildest cab ride? Uh, Shanghai. Mm-hmm. There we go. I thought so. Um, I got beaten to death by just yeah, about yeah. By, by the police before not knowing yeah, that... where the hotel was. <laughs> <laughs> Nickname your parents used to call you? Um, Rich. Okay. Bordies or Speedo? Bordies. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Have you ever... <laughs> Have you ever written a, written a display horse at a Chinese restaurant? Uh, yes, I, yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. Scale, scale of one to 10. Are you a good driver? Absolutely. 10. Uh, okay. Fill in the blank. Paul Hogan is. Awesome. Invisibility <laughs> or super strength. Uh, when I was young, I would have said super strength. Now I'm old. I, I would say invisibility. <laughs> best boss. Uh, best pass. Did you say best boss? Best boss. Mm. Um, All right. Beep, thumbs up. Best you're employee. Old you're old man. Oh, there we go. Best employee. We know the answer to that. Uh, uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Justin, Justin or Colin? Yeah. <laughs> Joe, right. settle down. Settle down until the end. Do, do you own a bicycle? No. Okay. What's your, what's your favorite clothing brand? Currently, Ariat. Okay. Have you ever tasted soap? Uh, yes. How many times have you sneezed in the last seven days? A couple. Okay. Is there any such thing as objective beauty? Absolutely. When you fly on a plane, do you wear a neck pillow? No. 
What animal adds more joy to the world, squirrels or llamas? I think squirrels. Yep, yeah, I'm with you on that. There we go. All right. Hey. We've gone through the lightning round on scale. Yeah. We'd, have to, we'd have to have another session just to follow up on some of those answers. Those, uh, yeah, yeah, those, yeah. Those are some wild <laughs> answers. All right, Vince. Well, yeah, Richard, I, it was great getting to learn about your story. Uh, honestly, I find it remarkable thinking about what, what you do today and how you've been able to take these things that you've been so passionate about with farming and finance, and you're helping all these family farmers. I know family is very important to you, so that's got to feel great. And it was, mm -hmm. it was awesome learning about it. So, so thank you for that. And, um, throw it out to you. Is there, uh, how do people get a hold of you? Is there anything else that you want people to know about for the, for the millions and millions out there that are going to be listening to this podcast? <laughs> You know, there's one there's one final point to close. So getting hold of me, um, just uh, go to legacylivestock.com.au, and uh, um, that's 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 the you know one of the businesses that AgriCap owns, and um, you can you can get a hold of uh, get hold of me through that website. Um, but w one last thing that I'd say throughout my my working life, and and particularly my what I would call my post corporate life, where I've been you know involved in startups and building building businesses, uh, it has always, always been about partnerships. And, you know, Justin and I, I felt were a terrific partnership in our days at Quantum. Uh, and and in my journey at, at, at AgriCap, um, you know, uh, I've got a wonderful co-founder, you know, who I haven't spoken about in this, this podcast, but her name is Sophia Benedetti. And we met and worked together when I was at, uh, the CEO at the North Australian Pastoral Company. And we are equal co-founders in Agri AgriCap. She's also of South African heritage, um, Joburg girl originally. Um, so you know, bit of bit of band. Must be a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she she's a, a, a terrific human being, and I you know I I've, it's always been about partnerships for me. And and um, you know she I just want to sort of give credit to to Sof for being you know a, a really instrumental and 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 you know absolutely vital component of 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 agricap and and our success going forward as well yeah i know we didn't get to talk much about agricap so we might have to might have to have you on again because uh I, I did listen to that other podcast it was really really pretty fascinating learning about what you do so yeah definitely have to to get you booked on another episode absolutely i'm, I'm coming i'm coming across this to you guys we're gonna yeah, we'll we do, it do it, it. We yeah, we do also, it gentlemen yeah. Yeah. yes <laughs> yes in, in closing in closing, in closing. Yeah. So, so uh, this has been the Opportunity Accelerators podcast. And for our guest, Richard Brimblecombe, and my wonderful, fantastic, well dressed, what with the, uh, you guys look great in your hats. For just the Joe, you got to do a, 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 a shoey out of that tweet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love it. So, for Justin, Joe, and myself, thank you for listening to Opportunity Accelerators, and until next time, storm on. This episode of Opportunity Accelerators has been brought to you by Skillstorm, where our purpose as an organization is to launch and accelerate tech careers. Please be sure to like and subscribe to catch the next episode.